Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm incredibly grateful to be here this morning, and I am not going to talk about being victimized, because I have never been victimized. Um, and I'm not going to talk about psychiatry, so you've been let off. What I'm going to be talking about is influenza. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the Tamiflu story. And this is what we are going to uh, discuss briefly this morning. This is the index content of what I'm going to talk about. It's a brief resume. The story starts in 1999 with the publication of the protocol and then the review, the Cochrane Review, on neur neuromidase inhibitors. These are antiviral drugs, so they're not vaccines, they're not injected, they're oral or inhalation against influenza. In uh, 2006, in the 2006 update of the Cochrane Review, which you see here in its uh, Lancet guise, we made a substantial change to the text of the review. Uh, and very much, like, uh, in, very much like Marianne talked about statins, we incorporated the meta-analysis known as the Kaiser 2003 meta-analysis, and its results you see highlighted here. The Kaiser meta-analysis showed an effect of Tamiflu on complications of influenza. Mainly we're talking here about pneumonia. Yeah? All clear up to now? So, if you're not feeling well, you take Tamiflu and your chances of getting a pneumonia are notably diminished. Now, this is vital, absolutely vital to understand this, because it formed the major part of the rationale for stockpiling huge amounts of Oseltamivir, Tamiflu. Uh, here is the Kaiser meta-analysis. And I need, just need to uh, give you a little bit of background. Since the mid-2000s, governments have spent millions of pounds stockpiling the two anti-influenza drugs called neuromidase inhibitors. That's the family. That's Oseltamivir, Tamiflu, which was pro uh, produced by Gilead Science, but marketed by Roche. Remember this particular, because it's going to come back. And Zanamavir, Relenza, which was produced by GSK. When the so-called swine flu, influenza, H1N1 pandemic struck in 2009, and whoever's, you, you got Newsweek there, that's the kind of stuff that was circulating at the time. Fear and the flu. The Australian and UK governments gave us a huge amount of money, 5,000 pounds, to commission a rapid uh, update of our existing review of the drugs. Also, I will tell you later on, but we also had something strange. Still in 2009, we had visit by a ghost, a real ghost, an ectoplasm, something looking like that. <laughs> As our review team began its work, it received a, an unexpected criticism, but also an unexpected visit. The uh, October 2009, the phone went off, and a voice said, Hello, Dr. Jefferson. I am the person who wrote the Hayden and Nicholson trials, of which I will tell you about in a second. I said, Hey, what's your name? And she said, Melanie Sinclair, PhD. I work for ADIS. I said, How do I believe you? How can I believe you? And he said, well, I'm a ghostwriter. You don't believe me? Here's my job description. Can you see it? Can, can you read it? Can you read it, guys? Yeah? Uh, the bottom bit says, ghost writes and edits of original articles, editorial letters, sequinavir, nelfinavir, ozeltamavir, serivastatin, risperidone, and fraxiparin. I don't know what fraxiparin is. Presumably it's a psychiatric drug, is it? Does anybody know what fraxiparin is? 
It's a heparin. Okay, so you've got a huge basket. And then he does all the other things like uh, patient information booklets and so on and so forth. Oh, uh, I said, that's very good. But um, uh, how am I going to deal with this? Well, at the same time, I received, or we received through the comments facility, a challenge and a criticism by Dr. Keiji Hayashi, who is a pediatrician in Osaka, in Japan. Hayashi pointed out that the key piece of evidence underpinning the previous Cochrane Review's conclusions that Tamiflu could uh, impact uh, influenza and other complications, well, that key, that key piece of evidence came from this meta-analysis. The, the, the important thing about this meta-analysis is that it was funded by Roche. Four of its authors, six authors, were Roche employees. Uh, the last author, Professor Frederick Hayden of Virginia University, was a paid consultant to Roche. Remember the name Fred Hayden, please. The first author, Professor Laurent Kaiser, had not received anything, but the data all came from Roche. So Hayashi said, wait a minute, have you seen the primary trials? And we said, well, we've only seen two, because only two are published. The other eight are unpublished. So the bulk of the stuff that was in the data, that was in the meta-analysis, was unpublished. So we were in a situation where there was an impending pandemic, in fact, that it was an unfolding pandemic, which everybody said would kill just about half the population, living population on the planet. We had a huge pot of money, 5,000 pounds, to, to update the review. And we had this criticism, which under Cochrane rules, you have to answer within six months. So we had to answer this criticism. So our team set out to respond to Hayashi's challenge by requesting the unseen trials, having a look at the data for the unseen trials, so we could proceed with our update. Despite the urgency of the situation, however, we found several challenges in our way, as described by Deborah Cohen in the 2009 BMJ investigation. John Trenner, seen here at the top, who was the lead author of two, the two pivotal Tamiflu trials which had been published and had been included in the Kaiser meta-analysis, told the BMJ, I did not perform an independent analysis of the primary data, which was not required or requested by JAMA at the time of submission. As you can see, the paper had been published in JAMA. And I do not have access to the primary data, which I also never requested. What about the other pivotal trial? Ah, uh, well, the other pivotal trial, maybe, maybe, maybe we get somewhere. When asked a similar question, Carl Nicholson, you see in at the bottom, he was the lead author of the second pivotal trial, Tramifu treatment trial, said he did not recall seeing the primary data. He said that a statistical analysis had been conducted by Roche, and he analyzed the summary data. I'm quoting verbatim from the BMJ investigation. What did Tommy Jefferson get from Kaiser and Hayden? Well, I sent them an email in August 2009, and this is the answer I got. I have searched, but can't find original files related to the 2003 publications. Before and again, after my two years at WHO in Geneva, blah, 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 the cat ate my data. So what do you do? You go to Rosh. You go to Rosh, we went to Rosh, I uh, asked Rosh, uh, and they said, yes, you can have the data, my friend. No problems. Sign one of these. Oh, whoa. Now, this is interesting, the confidentiality agreement. They said, well, there's, there's nothing to be worried about. It's standard, it's industry standard. Now you sign one of these. Okay, sorry about that. Oops, oops, oops. You sign one of these, and we'll give you the data. You can't publish it, but we'll give you the data. And I said, but I'm a researcher. If I can't publish the data, what use is it? There's something else in this confidentiality agreement that you should be aware of. I don't know if you can see it. 
but it's 3, 4, I. He says that I could not be able to disclose, once signed, the existence of the terms of this agreement. So it's a confidential secret agreement. And I think the KGB and MI5 would be proud of, <laughs> proud of this. It's a wonderful document. You can find it on the BMJ, unsigned on the BMJ website to this day. So we were getting nowhere. On December 2009, Roche publicly promised in a statement printed in the BMJ to release the full study reports to doctors and scientists. There's the text. But the Cochrane Group's efforts to obtain the promised full clinical study reports were met with numerous refusals again. So you promised, give, us, give it to us. No, was the answer. So the BMJ launched its first open data campaign to help ensure access so these data and other data which may be of interest, I put here two uh, links to the whole campaign which has been rejuvenated five days ago. So it's, the whole website has been updated. You've got the BMJ uh, Tamiflu, you've also got the Statins Tamiflu, and here you've got a, a, a Center for Evidence-Based Medicine timeline of events since the publication of our review. The campaign was based on the key decision to support transparent and accountable analysis and decision-making by opposing closed doors and confidentiality agreements. In 2012, we still hadn't had anything, so the BMJ intensified its efforts and began using open correspondence as a means of holding specific individuals and organizations to account. Open letters published in the BMJ by us to NICE, GSK, WHO, CDC, Roche, EMA. These were organizations that are licensed, they promoted the drug, they had pushed the drug in any way. And we were asking them, how did you reach your conclusions? How did you support your policy? And you can go and read all these as pages and pages and pages of letters from us. We never really got an answer. But the following facts emerged, and these are the important bits. WHO was recommending Tamiflu data, they'd never vetted, sorry, but recommending Tamiflu use, but they'd never vetted the data. EMA had approved Tamiflu, they never vetted the full data set. CDC was promoting the use of the drug, they had never seen the data set. CDC's promotion was taking place despite the fact that the FDA, which had vetted the data, required Roche to add a statement on the label saying serious bacterial infections may begin with influenza-like symptoms or may coexist with or without complications during the course of influenza. Here comes the punch. Tamiflu has not been shown to prevent such complications. FDA was saying this business about complications, no evidence of that. The majority of Roche's phase three trials were unpublished a decade after completion. As of today, nothing's changed. By October 2013, four years after Roche, Roche's original promise, we actually finally got the full clinical study reports of the 107 studies from EMA, GSK, and Roche, around 150,000 pages. These formed the basis for our latest Cochrane Review, updated and published in April 2014 in the Cochrane Library and two shortened versions of the BMJ. The original Kaiser meta-analysis and archives were six pages. Here are the trials. That's the full data set, 107. 77 from Roche, 30 from GSK. We concluded, after having looked at this stuff, that there was no convincing trial evidence that Tamiflu affected influenza complications in treatment or influenza infections in prophylaxis, at exactly the same as the FDA a decade before. We also raised new questions about the drug's harms, profile, and the mode of action. Also very important because the mode of action is tied to its harms. 
In addition, the review and the open correspondence, well, we made that available. The complete set of 107 trials is available on Dryad. We also published, the BMJ published all peer review comments from 2009, as well as all correspondence related review, make it possibly the best documented and most transparent review ever undertaken, and certainly the first Cochrane review to use a full set of regulatory data. There are no publications in this review. We ditched publications altogether. And here is a, uh, probably the thing I'm most, uh, for me, which is most important, which uh, is the reviews standing in the James Lind Library. And uh, our work stands with that of Carl Pearson, Avsina, James Lind, Doug Altman, Taddy Dickerson, Helen and Minky, Austin Bradford Hill. Mind-boggling. Let us just not forget the debt of gratitude that we owe to the Nordic Cochrane Centre for having busted, op busted open the secrecy of the European uh, Medicines Agency, that's in its old pre-Brexit uh, temple uh, in Canary Wharf. And one of the other uh, fallouts from all this is that we realised that we are here, we're looking at an evidence iceberg. Okay? Uh, this is the, what we call the RIOT iceberg. RIOT stands for Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials, which is an initi initiative to which I invite you to go on, on, on the website and have a look at what we're doing. RIOT, R-I-A-T. So you see, this is what's visible publications and sometimes registered. This is what is invisible, which is a huge mass of information, which is very important. And this is what is not visible. A lot of trials are still invisible. They are still invisible this day and age. The problem has not been solved. Some of these are visible, and some of these are also very badly distorted. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore the, uh, the trials. This is my last slide, one. Uh, I know it's not a very nice story, I hope you enjoyed it, but I can tell you that uh, nothing like this is ever going to happen again. This is history. It's finished. It's a historical uh, consideration. We are okay now. The problems have all, or nearly all, been solved. Uh, Ghostwriting, the closeness of researchers, the pharmaceutical industry, the production on Me Too drugs, it's on its way out. You can believe me because I'm a doctor, so I'm a trustworthy person. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Whoops! Ah! July, no, October 2018, the New England Journal of Medicine, telling us about the clinical performance of a new antiviral, aptly named Boloxavir. <laughs> now, Boloxavir is produced by Shinogi and marketed by... Well done, who was that? Okay, two first prizes. Who's the first author? <laughs> Professor Frederick Hayden. Thank you very much for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>